Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. What a beautiful day it was for the first day of fall. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, how good does it feel to be in the house of the Lord tonight? Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Before we get into prayer tonight, I stumbled across this verse today that's been on my that's been in my spirit all day long. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18, and everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. So many times I show up to a church just expecting the Lord to move, and I believe we haven't seen anything yet. I believe we're still to see greater things, but before we do anything tonight, before the Lord does anything tonight, can we just take a minute and just praise Him for just a minute? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Do we have any prayer requests on this side? Brother Jim. Sorry, Mom. Sister Crystal. Yes, ma'am, definitely. Brother Brandon. Yes, sir. Right. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma Sister Heidi. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Here in the middle. Sister Crystal. Yes, we'll remember them for sure. Ty. remember them for sure. Yes, ma'am. Sister Eloise. Yes, ma'am. Sister Aunt Margaret. Yeah. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Definitely. Sister Shauna. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. This side. Sister Maria. Definitely. Yes, ma'am. Sister Nadine. Well, definitely, definitely. Yes, ma'am. Sister Lacey. Yes, ma'am. Up here, Sister Amanda. And that is a nurse Jermaine, heart procedure in the name of Jesus. Her name. Yes, ma'am. Brother Fisher. Sister Kim. Yes, ma'am. 
Sister Scarlett. Definitely, definitely. Sister Nadine. Lord knows. Amen. Amen. Luke. More. Gotcha. Gotcha. Anybody else? Amen. Yep. Definitely. More members. A lot to pray for. Let's remember our country too. Keep our president in our, in our prayers, too. Pray over his decisions. There's a lot of talks going on. We really, really need to be praying for him. No matter what side you're on, left or right, we're for Jesus. That don't matter. We need to be praying for our country. Amen. But I believe the Lord's going to move tonight. I believe every time we come together, something happens. I feel the spirit every time we get in here. I, let's just go ahead and go into prayer. Lord, I love you so much tonight, Lord. I'm so thankful for everything you've already done, Lord. I pray that we find gratitude more and more living this life for you, Jesus. Lord, let knowledge and wisdom be the stability in these times, Lord. I pray that you, you give us knowledge and wisdom, Lord. Let us hunger for your word. Let us have desire for your word. And God, I pray the name of Jesus over every sickness that was mentioned tonight, Lord. I pray the name of Jesus of our minds and in, over any chemical imbalances in our mind. Heal us from depression, anxiety, Lord. I pray against COVID, Lord. I pray for healing from this disease, this Lord, I pray that in the name of Jesus, everybody in this church and everybody connected to this church, Lord, we have no more implications, no more altercations from COVID, Lord. God, I pray over our children and I pray over our youth. I pray that you use them now. I pray that you anoint them now. Use them in their schools. Use them in their homes, Lord. God, I just pray that your hand is upon this church, Lord. Lord, we love you and we just thank you, Lord. I pray that we can praise you in liberty tonight. In Jesus' name.
Someone lift their voice that they believe he's a chain breaker. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. It don't matter where you're at. He can break chains anywhere. As soon as you call on the name of Jesus, everything changes. Everything changes when Jesus shows up. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. May we get the ways to give on the board. Hallelujah. This is an exciting time of the night. We're getting to give to the kingdom. Hallelujah. Rejoicing. Hallelujah. We have Givelify, PayPal at riverbendpentecostals.com. Cash and checks can be mailed to Riverbend Pentecostals, 1031 Mill Street, P.O. Box 477, New Madrid, Missouri, 63869. Gold pans are for tithing and wood is for offering. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. After we pray, shake a hand, smile. Tell someone they're gl you're glad to see them. Hallelujah. We're, this is an exciting time. We get to see the kingdom grow. We get to see the kingdom grow in this time. If you don't mind, say this prayer with me. Upon the authority of your word, I have given, and it shall be given unto me, pressed down, shaking together, and running over. I am a tither and I give my offerings. I bring them today into your storehouse. Therefore, the enemy is rebuked. The curse is broken. I live, live under an open heaven. You pour out upon me such a blessing that there is not enough room to receive it. We receive jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, sales and commissions, benefits and settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and income, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, Bills paid off, debts demolished, and royalties received. My whole family saves and serving God in perfect health and abundance, walking in divine favor and blessing. I am blessed going in, and I am blessed going out, and all that I do will prosper in Jesus' name. i 
thank you for the freedom that is in this room, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. There's no sin he can't forgive. Any of us can be delivered. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. You may be seated. Hallelujah. We can get the youth to come up, the kids. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, yeah. Wow. How wonderful. How wonderful. I can't see who's that. Who's that? Sister Crystal, you can lead them back. Thank you. I couldn't see who's down there. Hallelujah. River been ignited. Hallelujah. Who's excited to learn tonight? Amen. Turn this over to Brother GL. Well, we're going to have a great Bible study tonight. Amen. Amen. Y'all wound up like an eight-day clock. And, uh, amen. I hear all this talking. Y'all shut down on me now. Boy, I'm going to be mad. No, not really. I'm glad you're happy to be in the house of the Lord. Nowhere I'd rather be. That's a true story. I have a great life. Don't misunderstand me. I have a great life, a wonderful family, but I don't know that I'm happier ever than right here in the house of the Lord. This is where I want to be. Amen. Is in the presence of the Lord. Um, Brother Shannon's give some handouts. Uh, looks like we had enough tonight. And... Uh, uh, Y'all want to share something with the rest of the class over here? <laughs> Brother Terrence, let me tell you something. This was a good corner. <laughs> we need to pray Brother Terrence's strength in the Lord. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, that, we, we did pretty good over there for a while, but something happened. Um... Tell you what, as good as it feels in here, I just want to kind of put my Bible study up on a shelf somewhere and open up the Bible and preach because that's how it's feeling in here tonight. Man, what a wonderful presence of the Lord. Amen. My goodness. Amen. Tonight, Wednesdays is my favorite service. Sundays, Sunday is my favorite service. But boy, I don't know how it can get much better than this. First Timothy chapter number one, and we'll be doing verses 12 and 13, and then verse number, I cut it back a little bit, peer pressure got on me, verse number 16, and uh, there'll be some other things in the middle, but uh, this is going to be maybe a little bit different, um, and then I'm, I'm afraid, I made myself a note because I'm afraid maybe the Lord is going to interject some stuff in the side of my notes. Uh, because I think there's going to be some um, revelation flowing in here tonight um, that says, you know what? I better tighten up. I better tighten up. There will be nobody, nobody riding the easy train through the pearly gates. Um, we got to get to work. We got to get to work. Verse number 12. I'm a little nervous tonight, so y'all bear with me. And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who hath enabled me 
for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Now, I love this verse, and I wouldn't care if y'all made a note to memorize it because it is a powerful verse as it stands alone. But I'm gonna share with you real quickly when it says, who hath enabled me. That word enabled me is one word for both of them. It's not just enabled, but enabled me. And it means I fill with power to impart ability, to make strong, and the one rendering says, hath given me strength within. Let me lay something out for you. You get filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, everything the Lord puts in your heart to do, he's already given you the power to do it. Everything the Lord has put in your heart, if the desire is there, the Holy Ghost empowers you to do it. Gotta be ready. When it says he enabled me, means I fill with power to impart ability, to make strong. He's given me strength within. This is, of course, referring to two things. All right? Because there are two works of the Holy Ghost always in your life. Right? Right? So if you said right, tell me what they are. Or unless you just trust me that much. Two works. The first is, of course, the regeneration, the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It is an event, all right? You receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost is an event, and it is for whosoever will. So the first, when the power is put in you is when you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And we've been teaching and preaching around here, and I hope it's starting to take hold that as soon as God gets a hold of you, you're ready to go to work for him. You're ready to go to work for him. So the first thing is you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. That is to fill you with power, to impart ability, to make strong. The second aspect of this is the operation of the Holy Ghost in you. So we receive the Holy Ghost, but we've already, I don't remember, I said it in elements and probably can't remember exactly how to say it again, but we have for too long offered people a diploma when they get filled with the Holy Ghost when we should be giving them a birth certificate. Because that's just getting started. That's not the finish. All right, it's just getting started. And all this is going to do is keep, keep uh, bringing us along on this path and on this journey until we are fulfilled and complete. And that is the plan of God that we be complete, that we be mature, that we be perfect to him. Yeah, I got two amens on that because we like to, we still fall in love with that business of nobody's perfect. That's not what that's talking about. We got to be fully mature in the kingdom of God as the Holy Ghost has led us. Grown, grown. Acts chapter one, verse number eight says you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. So the first uh, enabling is the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And then he says what? And you shall be witnesses unto me, both Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. That is the operation of the Holy Ghost. And Paul is talking about both of those things. All right, receiving the Holy Ghost, which is a focus for the last several weeks, having people get filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, it is for everybody, all right? It is for everybody. It is essential. It is not just a cool addition to salvation. It is salvation. If you have not the Spirit of Christ, you are none of His. You've got to be filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. That's important. But just as important, is you've got to let the Holy Ghost work in you. Without allowing the Holy Ghost to work in you, receiving the Holy Ghost doesn't do anything more for you. Okay? You still don't know what to do. You're a baby. Born again, remember? You just, uh, that's it. Okay? We have got to let the Lord bring us to perfection. Or completion. And 
The evidence of that undoubtedly according to Acts 1 and 8 is being a witness. Who are you discipling? Who are you investing in? Who are you working on? And we know good and well that may not even look close to would you come go to church with me or would you let me teach you a Bible study. It might just be somebody that you make a point to wave at every morning. That's discipleship. You're laying the foundation for the work of the Lord. But we learned also in elements class, y'all need to start coming if you're not. We also learned in elements class that if the salt loses its savor, I read it again this week, good for nothing but to be thrown out into a ditch. I do hope that the spirit is rattling some of our cages and making us think, you know what? I better get to work for the Lord. I better get to working for the Lord. He enabled me. What does that mean? It means when you go to work for him, you're going to be able to. You can do it. You can do it. This, maybe I should have preached tonight. It says he counted me faithful. That word faithful means reliable, trustworthy, persuaded. And again, there are two aspects of Paul's faithfulness. I hope to dig a little bit right now. Let me unpack this just a little bit. There are two aspects of Paul's faithfulness. First is the passion and commitment he displayed in his devotion to God in his old life and his loyalty to what he believed to be true. See, the apostle Paul's name used to be Saul, and Saul was public enemy number one to the church. He thought he was doing God a solid by throwing Christians in jail. He thought he was doing the work of the Lord and it was that commitment. Can everybody say commitment? Amen. God have mercy on us. If the Lord has to go out and find some good sinners to bring to the house of God so he can get something done. Yep, I said that exactly like I meant it. Because that's what he did with the Apostle Paul, Brother Blake, is he went and found somebody that was working against him, but his faithfulness and his loyalty His faithfulness, his loyalty, and his commitment to doing the wrong thing caught the attention of God. He counted me faithful in his old life and his loyalty to what he believed to be true. But Acts 9 and 15 says, when the Lord told Ananias, and I don't know why I keep, say, I, I keep bringing this up. I brought it up like 20 times in the last six or eight months. But the, but the Lord sends Saul to Damascus and he says, go there and I'm going to hook you up with a preacher who's going to tell you what you need to do. And then he went and told the preacher, I want you to go witness to Saul. And the preacher said, you must be crazy. <laughs> really? He tells the Lord, he said, are you sure you know what you're saying? This is the baddest dude in the country. He's probably faking us all out. But he told him in Acts 9 and 15, the Lord told Ananias and said, Go ahead, go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. And I want you to know, nothing spiritual has happened in Paul's life, but the Lord already sees him like he's going to be. Yeah. 
He's already telling Ananias, you better go preach to him. This is going to be a man that's going to make a big difference in the world. He is a chosen vessel, chosen by me. He counted me faithful. The second aspect of that faithfulness is as soon as the Lord spoke from heaven and told him what to do, he started doing it to the best of his ability. He's blind. He can't walk by himself. He's been a leader, but he goes immediately to Damascus, and as soon as Ananias comes in, Ananias says, Brother Saul, which that's a powerful truth right there, Ain't nothing changed in his life yet except he knows what the Lord's going to do for him. He ain't done it yet, but he's already calling him brother. That's powerful. But he began to immediately. Now, I feel this in the Holy Ghost. Somebody here tonight, you're going to receive something that I'm not teaching. That's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. But the Lord is ministering to you through the teaching of the word beyond that which I saw. So don't shut the Lord down just because you don't feel like you're quite getting what here. God is going to minister to somebody in a powerful way. Now I struggle with this all day, but I know I got a word from God. He obeyed the gospel as well as he could in every way after having it revealed to him. That is, he counted me faithful. Faithful is you is he who calleth you who will also do it. All right? The way that we prove our faithfulness to God is do what he says. There's not another way. Acts chapter 9, verses 17 and 18, Ananias went his way and entered into the house and put in his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, has sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell off of his eyes as it was scales, as if the Lord had put scales over his eyes and he received sight forthwith, that means immediately, and he arose and was baptized. And verse number 20 says, and I know this, this kind of uh, throws a kink into our tradition, but it's the word of God and it confirms what we've been preaching and straightway he preached Christ in the synagogue that he is the son of God. He said he counted me faithful. He enabled me, and I feel in the Holy Ghost right now, for that he counted me faithful. I was faithful to the wrong thing, and as soon as I heard about the right thing, I made myself faithful to it. Again, we have a beautiful picture of true repentance. It's much more than just saying, I'm sorry for the bad stuff I've done. It is very clearly saying, show me the way and I'll walk in it. Right. I'll go there. He obeyed the gospel. Acts chapter 26, verse 16 through 19. But rise and stand up on thy feet. That's Jesus talking to Paul. He's testifying about what God has done for him. For I have appeared unto thee for this purpose. Everybody say purpose. You're not here by accident tonight. Nobody walks through those doors. Somebody was, Brother Cody was mentioning to me before church uh, that every time we show up here on Sunday, there'll be a whole parcel of people we don't know who they are. And there's people showing up tonight who we don't know who they are, but we'll fix that if you don't run out of here scared. But there is no one, I believe this with all of my heart, Brother Blake, there is no one that enters into this house by accident or by coincidence. Everybody who shows up here shows up because the hand of God is on their life. And hear me as I say this, I won't back down. I'll lift my head up high and square my shoulders back and they can find whatever they need right here. But hear me as I tell you this. He won't count you faithful if you're not. Right. 
Look what he says. To make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Simply the Lord telling him, you go on what you've already got, but I'm going to establish you on what you're going to do. I'm still going to work in you. Delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. That's the Lord talking to Paul. He said, I'm going to go let you preach a message that's going to change people's lives. In verse 19, whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. When the Lord speaks to you, you've got to be obedient to him. There is nothing going to happen in your life from spillover blessings. Just showing up getting a little spill over Holy Ghost. You know what that gets us, Brother Shannon? That gets us running around in life like a crazy old dog chasing his tail, which is how we live for a whole lot of years. We had a Sunday morning and a Sunday night and a Wednesday night relationship with God, and the rest of the time we did our own thing. But I want you to know this, just like tonight. My, my microphone's still working, yeah. Just like tonight. The reason why we were so blessed back in the good old days is because there was some men and some women that were on their face before God and didn't nobody know it and didn't nobody have to know it. You want to know why we're getting the blessings that we're getting right now and seeing the revival we're getting right now is because there's some people that have decided I'm going to take a little bit of my time and give it to the Lord and I'm going to pray and I'm going to fast and I'm going to read and I'm going to seek the word of God. Hear me right now. You, we do not experience what we experience without a price having been paid for it. What do you think is going to happen in this house uh, when we really bring the unity of Pentecost uh, to the Riverbend Pentecostals? Uh, and no longer is it I got a handful seeking God, but I, I got a handful that don't, and they're on their way. Because the whole church is putting in the work, preparing. You want to know why? Because the Bible says... You seek after me and find me when you seek after me with your whole heart. Yes, I'm moving on. Sure. It, that was the king. That was the king. He was talking to a king named Agrippa. He, Paul, here's the deal about Paul. Part of this enabling was the Lord enabled him to impact everybody's life he came in contact with. And right now, right now, Paul is in jail. And he's been brought before the king. And he's got a chain and a ball on his leg. And he gets before the king. And instead of trying to proclaim his innocence, he begins to proclaim the gospel. And all he does, Brother Terrence, in Acts 9 it happened, in Acts 22 and Acts 26, he testifies about it. He just starts out telling them what the Lord has done for him. And he says, Agrippa, I don't know if I've ever understood that this might be the most powerful. What if the Lord does all of that stuff and Paul doesn't obey him? You know, there's a reason why the Bible says we are laborers together with him. And you're going to see that coming to pass right here in the next step. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. That does not mean calling me to preach. Are you ready? That does not mean he called me to preach. It means having appointed me to service. 
That word ministry means to serve. Jesus Christ taught his disciples who were wanting to be the big dogs all the time. They wanted to be the big dogs. But he put a towel around him and he washed their feet and he said, he that'll be the greatest among you, let him be your servant. If we begin to minister as Jesus ministered, better hold on, baby. You talk about and think you're seeing revival now, it'll blow the roof off this place if people can show up and be ministered to. Because remember, we're better because you're here. We're better because you're here. Having appointed me to service. The calling and establishing of Paul in service to and for the kingdom of God. It was God's idea. We'll say that again. Paul's calling establishment, the work that he's going to do was not his idea. It was God's idea. Brother Shannon, Paul did not even know what Ananias had been told. He said he's a chosen vessel. He's going to go preach the gospel, be a witness unto me to the Gentiles. He didn't even know it yet, Brother Terrence. It was God's idea. But it didn't, I want you to hear me right now. The Holy Ghost is working in here. I want you to hear me. I don't want you to be afraid, but I want to tell you right now, if you shut a deaf ear to the Lord, he is going to open it up in somebody else's mind. Somebody has got to realize when you come into the house of God, service after service after service, and you leave discontented, that's not an earthly discontent, and that's not a carnal upheaval. That is the Spirit of God having brought you to a place of tension where it's time for you to decide if you're going to cut bait or fish. It was, I feel Jesus right now. I almost lost my train of thought, and that's probably the devil, and plus me getting old. But the Lord said this is the plan. This is the idea. But at some point, Paul had to get on board and say, here's the deal, brother. I, I think I might have preached about this the other day, but so what? I'll do it again. When Paul gets the Holy Ghost, he's the loneliest man in the whole world. You want to know why? Because the ones he used to work for don't like him and they want him dead. And the one he wants to work with right now don't like him and don't trust him and are afraid of him. But you know what, Brother Blake? He had an experience that nobody on earth could take away from him. And he knew that God had put something in him. And I, I don't want to give you another little Bible study, but you know when, when he struck him down on the road to Damascus, uh, the Lord spoke to him and said, I am Jesus whom thou persecuted. It is hard for you to kick against the pricks. All right, now that was talking in my estimation, in my opinion, the Lord already knew that something had got into Paul's mind when he stood over a young preacher named Stephen who started out as a deacon but began to minister the gospel and he stood over him and they're stoning him to death uh, and all he hears come out of that boy's mouth uh, is Lord don't hold this against them. And he starts having heavenly visions and stuff in the middle of dying. You know what's happening, Brother Shannon? And it's happening to some of you in this room right now. He can't sleep at night. He wants to go to bed and sleep. Remember, I've told you this before. It seems like Paul got worse between Stephen and Damascus. You want to know why? He was running from God. But here's what's happening. God's got a plan for your life. How about we stop fighting? And how about we stop bucking? And how about we stop being rebellious and just say, Lord, I'm with you. You know what? Hear me as I tell you this. You will not be happy ever otherwise. Never. Never. Will you be happy? Right. 
He put me into the service. Yes, sir. I don't really know, but he was a grown man already because they wouldn't have taken him seriously until he was at least 30 years of age. And it's because you weren't considered a man until you're 30 years of age. And when they stood at Stephen's um, killing, execution, Saul was the ringleader. They would not have respected him at anything below 30. So he's in his 30s at least probably a little bit older because there's evidence to say perhaps the Apostle Paul was a member of the Sanhedrin, which was the Supreme Court of the Jewish culture, and he wouldn't have been able to be that till he was in his 30s either. So he's done been around a block a time or two. But the Lord, and I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, having appointed me to service. You understand that Paul has aligned himself with the will of God. So he says first, everybody all right? Does anybody know exactly what I'm talking about in the house when you come in here? I remember a young man coming here and he sat on this third row. He sat on this third row right here. And I thought he was disrespectful. I knew the old, the old boy. And he talked to his wife, turned back and forth the whole time. After church, he came up to me and said, how'd you know all that stuff? He said, every word that came out of your mouth was right exactly into my life. And that's what he was turning and telling his wife. He said, how does he know this? Some, you've been telling people stuff? How does he know all of this stuff? Okay, the truth is, Jen, the truth is, every time we all come into the house of God, we're there for purpose. There is nobody here, even tonight, not a soul here that the Lord said, I'm just gonna let him hang out for tonight. I'm just going to let them just enjoy being in my presence. No, there is purpose. And you are, I know this is not nice to say in some people's vernacular, you are pregnant with purpose. God's already put it in you. And all it takes for it to come to birth is for you to surrender to him. And what gets you all tore up? Don't you think I don't know there's a whole boatload of folks that show up here about two or three times a year. It don't hurt my feelings one bit. I'm thrilled to death that my brothers don't show up. You know why? They can't show up and be peaceful. I'm thr re really thrilled that my little brother's here with us tonight. They're all little brothers to me because I am the man with the plan. <laughs> the first one. But I don't want them coming in here sitting and getting calloused. I want them when they come in here, I want, yes I do. I know when the Holy Ghost starts moving and I see some, I want to call their name out right now, but I'm just not going to do it. But I'm not talking about my brothers, but I see young people raised in this church and they'll show up one or two times a year and they'll sit there about 30 seconds and big old tears start running down their face and goosebumps are running all up and down their arms and they can't sit still. You know what that is, Brother Blake? That's the Lord saying, I got plans for you. I got some purpose down inside of you and there ain't nothing gonna make you right until you line up with it. And here's the deal, Paul just got it a whole lot quicker than most folks do. He wasn't special uh, necessarily, Sister Maria. It's the way the Lord works on us all. You will have a light on the road to Damascus experience. You will have a time in your life when the heaven says, uh, I'm talking to you. You will. You will have a time. And the way we respond to it is often we get mad at somebody, we get nervous, make jokes, get up and leave, start playing with a youngin', something. Break out a Mountain Dew and a Snickers. 
Anything we do to distract. But why don't, I, don't, I know I'm in the Holy Ghost right now. Why don't we just say, you know what? I give up. I give up. Lead me, Lord, I'll follow. Anywhere you open up the door. Let your word speak through me. Show me things I've never seen before. Lord, I want to be a witness. You can take what's wrong and make it right. The Lord wants to use you. It's not just about getting you right. He said he's a chosen vessel, Brother Terrence. He's a chosen vessel. He's going to preach the gospel and be a witness unto me all over the world. And he's going to have to go through some hell trying to do it. That's in the book. Thanks be to God. Thank the Lord who hath enabled me. I know this is hard for us to swallow, but the Lord don't wait till you get filled with the Holy Ghost to decide what he's going to do with you. He does not. He does not. He's already got a plan for you. Thanks be to God who hath enabled me, who put his power within me, who filled me with power, ability, made me strong on the inside, and he counted me faithful and appointed me to service to and for the kingdom of God. Verse 13. Who was before a blasphemer? Before. Aren't you thankful that there's a before? Before, who I was before being enabled, being counted faithful and put into the ministry. It's now a sharp contrast. The apostle Paul is in effect holding on to nothing of who he was. That he might, as he says in one other place, gain the more. He said, I was a blasphemer. That means this is a picture of our world, okay? It's a picture of our world. Now, I'm going to say this. I'm going to say it one more time. I hate even preaching about Facebook, but y'all making me. <laughs> For crying out loud, stop posting conspiracy theory stuff. Stop posting stuff that somebody else made up up in Montana where they don't have nothing to do but sit around and dream up stuff and put it on the computer that the world is ending. Can I let you know there ain't but one person in charge and his name is Jesus Christ. And people that look to him need to act like they look to him. I'm sorry, but it's the truth. He said, I was a blasphemer, speaking evil, slanderous, reproachful, railing, and abusive words. I realized something. You can't blaspheme without speaking. Everywhere you look, everywhere you go, blasphemy, not just against the Holy Ghost or against the church, but blasphemy is rising up and people are getting braver and braver and braver and we can't be afraid because Trish, they threw Paul in jail. I didn't tell this part a while ago. Brother Billy mentioned it a few services ago, but they had to put Paul's guards on a special rotation. They could only stay there for a little while because if they stayed a whole shift, he'd have them filled with the Holy Ghost before they got off. You know what? Sister Dana, Paul could have been set free. He was a free, rough-born Roman citizen. But he appealed to Caesar. You know why? Because the Holy Ghost said, I want you at Rome. He just let the state pay his fare there. 
I'm telling you the truth. It was the will of God that he be thrown in jail because it was in jail where he could reach the people that God wanted him to touch. Come on now. Say, well, I don't like that. Let me tell you something. You want to keep your baby here and do this and do that and do that? Well, just let him keep on doing it. But if you're going to really give them to the Lord, let him use them. What? No, that went over like a one egg pudding. Everywhere and to everyone. I'm, I'm, I'm not getting in that big a hurry. I thought I might, but I changed my mind. Let me tell you all something. We had somebody here Sunday. It was your buddy. I love him. Most truthful guy we've ever had. He said, boy, I love your church and I love what you feel. Your pastor's a little crazy, though. <laughs> Border, borderline crazy is what he said. Borderline crazy. <laughs> yes. Somebody gets it, finally. I'm not all alone up here. Yeah, old, old Tommy, he just thinks he came up with that, I'm here but I'm not all there stuff. I've been living that for 48 years. Everywhere and to everyone, Paul did not stop speaking against the way because that's what they called this in the early days. They called it the way. When you look in the Bible, uh, Acts chapter 9, verse number 1, I think it is, and a couple other places, you'll see the way capitalized. That's because that's what they called it. Because, Sister Sheila, when Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, they took him literally. They called it the way. Is that right, Sister Nadine? In the early 1900s, they called it the way. Paul didn't stop. Everywhere he went, everybody would listen. The coffee shop, eating dinner, at the break room, at work, wherever he went, he was letting everybody know, I'm against those Christians, and I'm going to do everything I can to tear them down, to tear Jesus down. He was against everything, and he never shut up about it. Because of his constant barrage of blasphemous words, he got a reputation among believers and those opposed to the way. That's why Paul was being used of the enemy is because he let it be known where he stood. He said, I'm a persecutor. That is properly defined as one who pursues or hunts down. The Apostle Paul had warrants. It's not really what they were, but that's the way we would understand it better. And they gave him legal authority to hunt down followers of Jesus Christ. He made this a part of his vocation. He considered his responsibility to make sure that the message of Jesus Christ and the gospel of his death, burial, resurrection was shut down. Paul said, I persecuted this way unto death, which means if all else failed, we killed them. This is Paul. He said, I was a blasphemer. I never shut my mouth running down Jesus Christ in the church. He said, I was a persecutor. I hunted them down. Threw them in jail. I got legal authority to do that. Y'all understand, if they come out making some kind of law that we can't preach and stuff, it's happened before. Don't look so scared. They start persecuting us like people are prophesying they're going to persecute us. Let me tell you what's going to happen. You want to know? The bride is going to swell. And revival is going to come because it always has. Revival don't come when everybody loves us. Revival comes when the, when the lines get more clear between the people of God and the people that serve the enemy. That's when revival comes. He said, I was injurious. I was a blasphemer, means I didn't ever shut up talking bad about the people of the way. 
I was a persecutor. I hunted them down, threw them in jail. If necessary, we caused them to tap out. He said, I was injurious. That means he took pleasure in hurting other people. He made a physical example out of believers. He followed up on his words, fulfilled his reputation, had him arrested, thrown in jail, and we know he was a, took part in Stephen being killed. And here's the deal. In his mind, he was right with God the whole time. And he thought he was on God's side. But he says, but I obtained mercy. Everybody say mercy. mercy. Say it one more time. Mercy. You know what mercy is? It's God withholding judgment that you deserve. Mercy is when you don't get what you deserve. He said, I obtained mercy, which means I deserved for God to bring judgment. So I'm going to stay up here because I want to. I deserved judgment. I deserved judgment. But mercy said, no, not today. Mercy said, no, not now. Mercy. He said, this is why I obtained mercy. I did what I did ignorantly in unbelief. Meaning I didn't know. And what I didn't know couldn't give birth to faith in me. Even though we knew the Bible backwards and forwards. The enemy had blinded his mind. But I want you to know, when did mercy show up? When did mercy show up? Before faith and before knowledge. Mercy is in effect when I'm faithless and unlearned. I want to preach to somebody right now. I don't care where you are, where you're going, where your mind is. The mercy of God endures forever. Mercy's calling you. Let me tell you something. Brother Blake, I promise you, cross my heart and hope to die with a thousand needles poked in my eye. I don't deserve this. I'm not behind this pulpit because I'm worthy of it. I don't deserve to feel one blessing because there was a lot of years. Y'all think we've had some good church? Let me tell you something. Back in the day, we had some moves of God. People slain out in the spirit. Now, I will say consistently, we've had as strong a move of God as I've ever felt. Consistently. I'm not speaking belittling of what we have, but I'm telling you, this ain't new. All right? This has been around since who flung the chunk. Okay? It's been around a long time. And the presence of God is rich and powerful and beautiful but ain't there and one of us deserves it. If we got what we deserve, Brother Terrence, we wouldn't be allowed in here. If we got what we deserved, we would be probably too ashamed to stick our head through the door in here. I guarantee you, if the Lord all of a sudden put a movie screen on top of everybody's head and start showing all your business, I ain't leaving the house. I don't want no, there's things in my life I don't want nobody ever knowing. Matter of fact, if the Lord wants to whoop some holy forgetfulness on me right now, I'll take it. I'm not worthy of none of this stuff but mercy. Mercy was reaching for me when I wasn't reaching for him. Mercy was knocking on my heart's door when I didn't want to listen. You know what that is, Sister Leanne? They would not never let us go. It was mercy. It was mercy, not because he didn't want us to enjoy life, but he knew we were missing out 
on the greatest fulfillment mankind has ever known. And that is building a bridge for somebody to cross between an eternity headed to hell and hope making it to heaven. Brother Terrence, we build that bridge. We build that bridge and it's called mercy. Mercy makes a way when there is no way. I looked this up. I obtained mercy is one Hebrew word. And it means, are you ready? I hope I put it in your paper. To show mercy as God defines it. That is, it accords with his truth. Don't you think for one second that God invalidates who he is to show mercy. He does not do it. He does not compromise who he is because we need mercy. But Brother Shannon, mercy is bringing us to him always. He's not intimidated by your sin. He's not afraid of our failure. Brother Blake, I'm teaching tonight about the Lord going and making a special trip to encounter a murderer because he wanted him. Mercy as God defines it. You know why they don't believe? They don't know. I believe with all of my heart Say, well, they got some backsliders. Let me tell you why people have such a hard time living for God is because we've never let them get to the next level of acting on what God has done in their life. But we want to try to put them into some kind of apprenticeship program and we want to try to put them into some kind of waiting deal and we need to start turning people loose the minute that they realize God's got a plan for me. I don't know what it is. You know what? I don't know either, but go to work. That's why this week, let me tell you something, www.pentecostalpublishing.com. You can find books and Bible studies and everything. This week I ordered $112.35 worth of books. Uh, you know what I'm calling that? GL's Discipleship Program. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to give them away to people, Sister Maria. I'm going to just keep giving them. It's one of them says when you pray, that's discipleship. One of them says when you fast, uh, that's discipleship. One of them says when you give. I just went and bought me a whole parcel of them, and I'm going to give them out to hungry people, and that's called discipleship. Because you know what, Brother Blake? When this, I've got a glimpse of what God wants to do, and I'm inviting you to come go with me. They don't believe because they don't know. But there is mercy. There's mercy. Mercy as God defines it. As it accords with his truth. Expressed on his terms. How do we know what that is? How do we know what that mercy is? How do we know? Not just that we've experienced it because... You're right, you're right, but we can tell it and we talk about it, testify, and they say, I don't know if I believe that or not. But I can go to the book. You know, I got a good picture of mercy. You know where it's at? In the life of Paul. Look here, look here. That's why my Tuesday night brothers, we get in the word. Because you know what we're going to find in the word? Truth that sets us free, that propels us. Look at here. We know because the example of Paul, the purpose and the magnitude of mercy, which saw Paul as he was, not a murderer, not a loudmouth bully, not as a uh, persecutor of the brethren, not as even a murderer, he saw Paul as somebody that was falling way short of what he was capable of. He saw him missing out on what his heart really desired. Rather than magnifying his wrongs, he didn't excuse his wrongs. But, Brother Larry, I thought about you as I wrote this note down. 
And I'm probably going to start a fasting and praying group to help me be able to sing like Brother Larry. Because if I could, I'd be singing it right now. He saw not what I was, but he saw what I could be. That's what happened in Paul's life. He didn't see what he was, a murderer, a low-down, snake-in-the-grass, a playground bully. He said, I want him. Verse 16. How be it for this cause I obtained mercy. I want you to ask yourself, why would he give me mercy? Paul said there's a cause for mine. Here's what Paul says. I love it, Brother Terrence. He says that in me first, Jesus Christ might show forth all long-suffering. for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Paul is saying, what does that word long suffering tell us about Paul and the Lord? The Lord had his plans for Paul in place, Brother Cody, a long time before Damascus but he had to wait on him until he got to the right place. You think about this just for a minute. What if Stephen had to die for Paul to be saved? Stephen, hear me right now, I'm talking about Holy Ghost. Stephen ministered to Paul in death in such a manner that revolutionized the Apostle Paul's life who revolutionized the world. You want to know how that happened? Not because Stephen was a cool cat. Not because he was a good speaker and not because he was just a good man. You want to know why? Because the Lord put something down in Stephen. Enabled him. He enabled him. He enabled him. Because you go read Stephen's qualifications and you read even when Stephen was dying, it describes him as being full of the Holy Ghost. It'll change you. Paul said, take my life as an example of mercy for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to everlasting life to them which hereafter would get mobilized and loosed and launched on the road to eternity. Lord, I love you tonight. I thank you for your power, for your word. And more than anything right now, I thank you for mercy. And, and all this teaching that we've done tonight, I've had a good time, I've enjoyed it, but... Here's what I pray gets embedded in us tonight, Lord. I pray this over everybody in this room. I pray that our default response to each and every person that crosses our path is to first think of mercy. In my own life, Lord, I don't want to be a judgmental jerk. I don't want to be governed by my emotions and by my feelings. I don't want, if I'm having a bad day, think it's all right to just miss out or just it's all right to... to isolate myself and back up somewhere and hide and, and do my own thing, Lord. I want to always be surrounded, enveloped, motivated by mercy. Mercy. Lord, I want to have mercy because that's what you had on me. That's what brought me to this place, God. You know, Lord, I pray often. I don't know how we got here. I don't know how we got here, Lord, because I tried every way possible to get you to change your mind. You didn't. You didn't give up. So I thank God for mercy. But more than anything, I pray to be a man of mercy. If there needs to be any judging, I'm going to leave that up to you, Lord. You're the righteous judge. But I want to show mercy. 
And I pray, God, that everyone under the sound of my voice, they've been trying to run. I see one. I know one you're talking to right now, Lord. They've been trying to run. They've been trying to immerse themselves in ungodliness and immorality and, and lascivious behavior to hide, to hide from the pull of the Holy Ghost on their heart. But you let them know tonight that you don't give up easy and that your mercy is still extended to them. I pray, God, that this sinks down into our spirit, becomes a part of who we are, your mercy that endures forever. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen, 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 amen. Praise the Lord. Why don't you stand with us if you would? Uh, as we're closing in prayer, I don't recall if anyone said it, but Brother Skipper is very sick this evening. And, uh, and uh, I don't mind saying this publicly, the Lord has done an incredible work in his life. Incredible work. And uh, I want us to pray that his faith holds on. I want us to hope, pray that his faith, because that's the example Jesus gave for us when he told Peter, I've prayed for you that your faith fail not. Because that's the only, if we hold on to believing, remember Jesus said, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. Amen. Is there anybody here tonight that you really feel like the word is spoken to you and you're not ashamed to raise your hand and say it? Say it. I, I feel like it spoke to me. I felt like it spoke powerfully to me. Don't be afraid to be used of God because your past is not powerful enough to negate your purpose, especially when Jesus gets involved. Sunday morning at 10 o'clock, we'll have elements class. And again, I want to invite all of you to come. It's an incredible, it's, it's, just, it's just an incredible experience. From 10 to 10.45 is elements. At 11 o'clock will be our service. And uh, uh, Brother Mike Burke will be ministering for us Sunday morning. And I talked to him this week, and he's really looking forward to it. And uh, then uh, uh, I'll be out of town tomorrow. And Friday, I'll be home Saturday. And then beginning October the 3rd, I'll be gone. Uh, uh, I'll be gone October the 3rd. I'll be back home October the 9th. And uh, then I'm preaching out again October the 24th, but I'll be here the rest of the time. But our ministry team is going to be speaking October the first, second, third, and fourth Sundays of October. Brother David's going to be ministering the first Wednesday in October. And uh, I expect all of y'all to be here. We have an incredibly anointed team, incredibly anointed team. And these guys are powerful powerful men of God. And I, I hate that I can't be here for all of it, but, uh, but you're going to support them and minister with them. And that's orders from headquarters. That's what I expect. Amen. Make every effort to be here in October. We, we need our whole church here. We don't even know how many folks we got attending here. That's a true story. We don't know how many folks we got attending because we can't get everybody here all at once. <laughs> so, any more announcements? So don't forget about the coats. Get to working on the coats. We need 40 of them. Real nice coats for foster children. November the 14th, I think it is. But be, be out buying some coats. Yes, ma'am. Don't forget about the vigil that night. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Y'all come to that. Invite somebody to come with you. If you don't have somebody already planning to be there, it's going to be fun. Look it up back there. We're going to have it at Poppy's. Let me say this to you, too. Go to Poppy's every chance you get. They're playing good, solid gospel music in there. They're Christian-focused. It's good food. It's good breakfast, good lunch, good, good coffees and different drinks. Go and support them. Yes, make a special effort to go out there and support them. Can I get an amen? amen. We're going to do that because we're far New Madrid. And we're far New Madrid County. 
and we're far parts unknown because I don't know where some of y'all hail from. <laughs> but wherever you're from, I'm for you. And I believe in you. And thank you for coming. You're dismissed in Jesus' name. God bless you.